Worldwide statistics on those who go missing can be fairly difficult to establish as there are many countries who simply either don't report the cases or don't make the information public. Specifically, most developing countries in places such as Africa, Asia and Latin America don't seem to be recording these incidents properly. However, with that being said, experts have been able to estimate that approximately 8 million children go missing each year around the world. If adults were to be included into that equation, it's not clear by how much the number would rise. It's worth pointing out though, that far more individuals under the age of 21 seem to go missing than those above 21. In 2019, the United States of America stated that 161,108 people over the age of 21 went missing, while over 448,000 under that age went missing. It's worth pointing out that the vast majority of these incidents are solved in one way or another, but of course, there are occasions where the missing are never found. Taking United States data into account, the missing over 21 accounted for 26% of the total. Meaning, if the same situation was true for every other country, the estimated number of missing people worldwide per year could be over 10 million. However, official statistics don't exist for this question, so that number shouldn't be taken with any degree of confidence or certainty, and is missing a whole range of factors. I was also hoping to find official statistics on the number of individuals that go missing every year in a rural setting, but if they exist, I couldn't find them either. Perhaps relevant here though, is that the extremely rural state of Alaska records missing persons at almost twice that of the national average. Now let's begin with the country of Canada. The Warburton family, consisting of parents Doreen and Tom, and their children Gary and Andrew made the trip from Hamilton, Ontario to see relatives in Beaver Bank near Dartsmouth in Nova Scotia. The year was 1986 and the family arrived at their destination on the 1st of July. At the time, they were staying with an Aunt Helen and the Bulger family on Tucker Lake Road. Living opposite the Bulger family was the Carr family, of which the parents had twins around the age of Andrew who was 9 years old. Andrew and Gary would always play with the twins when they came to town and this day was no different. All four decided that they wanted to go swimming and all parents agreed to this and at 3.40pm the boys set off for a 20 minute swim in the nearby lake. It's not clear why, but Andrew was delayed for reasons that I'm not aware of and the three boys headed off without him. The path to the lake was directly behind the Carr family's home in the woodland. This path branches off into two directions, going right will take you to Tucker Lake, while veering left will take you deeper into the woods. The twins mother, Violet, was the last person to see Andrew at 4pm on the back step of her home, but after that he was never seen again. Andrew never made it to the lake, and when the boys returned home for dinner, the alarm was raised when only three returned. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police were made aware of the situation and arrived at 5.45pm. All the while, the families and neighbours were already out mounting their own search for the boy. Another young boy by the name of Hob MacDonald was thought to be the last person to see Andrew. Hob had just returned home from a summer camp and told the authorities that he had seen Andrew earlier next to Beaverbank River. Hob recounted that Andrew took off his sneakers, crossed the stream and then put them back on. This surprised Doreen and Tom because Andrew was afraid of the river due to a prior incident involving leeches and as a result, they said that Andrew avoided rivers. 45 minutes after the Royal Canadian Mounted Police arrived, tracking dogs were deployed inside the woods at 6.30pm. Shortly thereafter, 100 searchers flooded the scene and entered the woods. This was a very quick response by all measures. But sadly, the searchers didn't find any clues and at no point did the dogs find his scent. On the 5th of July, 1986, the Brandon Sun reported this. Four days after Andrew disappeared into dense woods outside Halifax, the nine-year-old is still missing despite the best efforts of hundreds of people who are combing the area looking for him. Search efforts were maintained overnight, with about 400 people scouring the woods near Beaver Bank, about 12 and a half miles northwest of Halifax. 
In addition to the people in the woods, another 200 to 300 volunteers were on the site, ready to help teams of tired searchers coming out for a break. The search coordinator, Mike McKenzie, stated that the response from the locals had shown an overwhelming solidarity among the community. He said that they had over 1,000 people out in the woods at times. According to reports, the searchers fully expected to find the boy given the efforts, but this search was unsuccessful and Andrew was thought to have remained in the woods lost and alone. On the third day of the search, the weather, which had been fine previously, took a turn for the worst when heavy rains poured through the area, forcing searchers to pull out of the woods for a period of time. The weather was said to have improved the following day when the searchers poured back in. Mike thought that the teams had made some progress when they stumbled upon some small footprints that they believed were created by Andrew. The footprints seemed to indicate that he was alone, but they said that they soon lost the tracks. Two helicopters were up in the air above the finding, but unfortunately the pilots never made any sightings. The authorities must have been left a bit dumbfounded given the extensiveness and scope of the search involving many hundreds and upwards of 1,000 searches at times. But this didn't provide any clues other than the finding of the footprints, which presumably must have stopped at some point. Given the futility and growing desperate, calls were made and divers, along with 400 members of the Canadian military, descended on the area. It seems that there must have been some confusion among the searchers because on the 7th, the Brandon Sun reported this. Several searchers claim to have seen the missing boy since Tuesday, but the area is heavily populated with deer and other wildlife. Mackenzie said overzealous searchers may have mistaken them for a fleeting boy. Mistaking a boy for a deer sounds very odd to me, but I presume these mistakes can and do happen in wooded areas. Though I'd like to rely on and hear from those who spent extended periods of time in the woods in regards to the likelihood of several, or perhaps many, misidentification incidents such as this from a whole range of people. Staff Sergeant Smith said that the reports were probably mistaken as he didn't believe that the boy could have travelled as far as the searchers were reporting. Certainly strange, but again, it's best to hear from experts on this in regards to the ease of which these misidentifications can occur. According to search organisers, this was the biggest search effort in the history of Nova Scotia, with more than 3,000 people from all walks of life, engineers to woodmen, had scoured over 30 square miles of the area. Many are trying to keep an air of optimism in the face of fading hope from others present. Mike McKenzie said that the searchers are still hopeful because of the large amount of fresh water in the area, as well as berries and other edible plants. Many searchers have been sitting silently in the trees overnight in the hopes of spotting the boy. The writer of the article goes on to relate a similar incident that occurred a month prior. Another boy, 15 years of age called Kevin Schneidermeyer, disappeared in a wooded area in Ontario. Two weeks after he disappeared, he was found passed away floating in the river. What was odd about Kevin's disappearance was that searchers believed that they were closing in on him at many points during the search. Searchers reported finding what they believed to be his footprints and fires left behind. They said that his tracks indicated long strides as though he was sprinting away. The question I would pose is what was Kevin running away from? Did he feel scared or threatened? Did he believe that a nearby third party wanted to do him harm? Was Kevin severely confused and suffering from an irrational fear of the searchers? Perhaps he didn't know that they were searchers and instead thought that they were out to get him. If he had been spooked beforehand and then later heard footsteps near him, he could have ended up unknowingly running away from the searchers. It's strange, but I have seen this behaviour discussed by search and rescue personnel in other cases. Or at least searchers theorising that's what may be occurring. In the case of Andrew, bad news arrived on the 9th, eight days after the initial disappearance. Hundreds of military personnel were reportedly in the woods non-stop and one soldier came across a pair of small sneakers which were identified as belonging to Andrew. Obviously at this point, this was where the coordinated search effort and the military personnel were now focused. According to the Brandon Sun, searchers found the body at about 5.20pm, 100 metres away from the shoes. The body was found in an alder thicket in a gully of marshy ground about two miles away from the home the Warburtons were visiting. 
It appeared he just got tired and put his head down to go to sleep, and that's how we found him, said Constable Dwayne King. The autopsy would later reveal that Andrew was likely to have passed away as a result of hypothermia. This was a heartbreaking disappearance, and unfortunately in the end, Andrew wasn't found in time, despite the search effort being as extensive and enormous in scope as it was. I wonder if the sightings early on were accurate, but similar to the theory on Kevin, Andrew was fearful and as a result was running away from the searchers, mistaking them as a threat. Ultimately, we will never know, and the best we can hope for now is that other families learn from this incident and don't leave their children to venture out into the woods alone. The disappearance of Matthew Green provides a cautionary tale for everyone that loves to spend time in the wilderness. This is a man that disappeared from the face of the earth and failed to leave behind a single trace or clue as to what happened to him. Matthew was 39 years old and was considered to be very intelligent. He was a high school math teacher at the time, but he was also a very experienced climber and he did this a lot in his free time. In mid-July of 2013, Matthew was dropping his car off at an auto shop for repairs in the Mammoth Lakes area. This is a small ski town in California's Eastern Sierra, bordering Yosemite National Park. This is a trip that had been successful and enjoyable up until now. He and a number of friends of his had been climbing in the area, but around the time they were planning to leave and head back to Colorado for more climbing, his car blew a head gasket. His friends still left as planned and he agreed to meet them at a Colorado mountain range. Only Matthew would never meet with his friends again. As the work on his car progressed, he sent a text to his friend which read, I may have to spend the rest of my life here in Mammoth. The final time Matthew was heard from was when he spoke to his parents on the phone on the 16th of July 2013. The following day, he was supposed to pick his car up, but he never showed up at the garage. What was found thereafter was that his campsite was left untouched, meaning that there didn't appear to have been any kind of struggle with a third party or animal. The authorities then contacted his bank and phone provider. It was realised that his credit cards hadn't been used, nor had he made contact with anyone else. There was one clue left behind at the campsite though, a couple of pages torn out from a mountaineering book which perhaps hinted at the Minarets and Ritter Range. This is a rugged mountain area in the Ansel Adams Wilderness. Even today, we're not sure if Matthew actually made it to the Minarets and his body has never been found. He never told anyone where he was going or what he was doing, so the assumption was that he was going to relax around the campsite and wait for the car, but this clearly wasn't the case. The problem this caused was actually quite major because the authorities had no earthly idea where they were even supposed to begin the search. As a result of this, the official search couldn't even begin, so instead they sent search teams on training efforts to the Minarets and Ritter Range. As well as doing their own training, the other objective was to find any kind of sign that Matthew had been there. They checked the logs but didn't find Matthew's name printed nor did they find any physical signs either. In 2016, more than 600,000 Americans were reported missing, according to the FBI's National Crime Information Center. At the end of the year, nearly 85,000 of those cases were still active. Matthew Green is the only unsolved missing person case in Mammoth Lakes. Most people assume that Matt was a victim of some sort of climbing accident, a fall of some sort, says John Greco, Matthew's good friend and climbing partner that met him in California. But all his friends agree that he was experienced, skilled and careful in the mountains. Perhaps it didn't even cross Matthew's mind to tell anyone where he was going, and this is something we should all think about from time to time. We all have a normalcy bias, and because he was so experienced at climbing and had done so many times, the thought process for him was probably automatic and subconscious. It was probably something along the lines of, it's normally okay, therefore it will be okay this time. Had Matthew have told anyone where he was going and what his plans were, this may have been a very different story. 
Matthew's loved ones and friends all spoke of how fit he was and how his love for the outdoors translated into an exceptional skill set over the years. When he was young, he became a boy scout and spent much time with his dad in the wilderness. This would eventually lead to Matthew spending a great deal of time in mountainous areas with his friends, camping and climbing. He was very highly regarded by everyone who knew him. More than two weeks after Matthew talked to his parents for the last time, Detective Hornbeck contacted Verizon for an emergency information request. Verizon concluded that Matthew's phone had been powered off for quite some time and there was no way to track the current location. The last ping Verizon registered was on July the 16th from Mammoth Mountain and it had created a cone shape with towers in Fresno and June Lake. The Mammoth Lakes Police Department did not find any evidence of foul play and the potential of this being a purposeful act was quickly ruled out. As mentioned previously, because Matthew hadn't told anyone of his plans, the search and rescue teams couldn't even begin the search efforts. They said that there were so many trailheads within the cone area given by Verizon that it was an impossible task. This really was a desperate situation and the entire effort was effectively blind due to a lack of information. Matthew's family hired an aerial tour company to continuously fly over the area, but this provided no help at all. Detective Hornbeck would later say, what frustrates me the most with Matthew is he's so experienced, but he didn't tell anyone where he was going. There's nothing wrong with sending a text and saying, hey, I'm going to go climb in the minarets today. That would solve a lot of problems. It will probably never be completely clear what happened to Matthew, and despite eight years passing now, no sign of him has ever been found. There is, however, an important lesson to be learned and that is to make sure that at least one trusted person knows of your plans. As far as I can tell, that is pretty much the extent of the paper trail on Matthew's disappearance, so let's move on to the next one. Gary Matthias, Jack Hewitt, Jack Madruga, Theodore Wire and William Sterling, these men are known as the Uber Five. This is their story. Let's start from the beginning. The five men, often referred to as the boys by their loved ones, were all very good friends. Gary Matthias was 25 and came from Olivehurst, California. Gary lived with his parents and worked for his grandfather's gardening business. He had served in the military, but was discharged five years prior to his disappearance for psychiatric reasons. Gary had been diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and was known to have had violent outbursts while in the army. Jack Hewitt was 24 years old and came from Marysville, California. Jack also lived with his parents and was diagnosed with mild learning disabilities. Jack Madruga was 30 years old and lived with his parents in Marysville, California. He had unfortunately been laid off from his job working as a busboy a few months prior and also had undiagnosed learning disabilities. Theodore Weyer was 32, also from Olivehurst, California and was diagnosed with learning disabilities. And finally, William Sterling was 29 years old and from Yuba City itself. He was good friends with the rest of the group and was a deeply religious man. What happened to these five men was nothing short of disturbing. As mentioned, all five men were high functioning and all attended vocational rehab. All five played basketball together in a Special Olympics team called the Gateway Gators and by all accounts were very excited to be playing in a tournament that coming Saturday. The winner of which was set to win a week in LA with a trip to Disneyland. Before the tournament, the men had made plans for the Friday night before to attend a basketball game. So on February the 24th, 1978, they all got into Jack Madura's 1969 Mercury Montego and drove roughly 50 miles to watch the game. After the game had finished, they got back into the car at 10pm to head home. During this drive, they stopped three blocks away from the game at Beer's Market and bought some snacks. 
Afterwards, they left and drove south to head home. However, that would be the last time that any of them would be seen together, and the last time that any decisions they made would make sense. Saturday morning arrived, and the men were all reported as missing. All of the families said that this was completely out of character for them, as when they normally went out with one another, they would always come right back without issue. All concerned were now convinced that something terrible had happened given that the men were excited to play in their basketball game, which they had now all missed. A 55-year-old man by the name of Joe Shones was driving on a mountain road near Rogers Cow Camp in the Plumas National Forest. He wanted to see if weather conditions were good enough to take his family for a weekend trip the following day. Unfortunately for Joe, as he continued onwards, snowdrift slowed him down to the point of stopping. He got out of the car in an attempt to push it to carry on, but this brought on searing chest pains. Joe was having a heart attack miles away from help. Obviously panicking, Joe got back into the car and began to think about what to do next. Suddenly, he noticed two sets of headlights, one of which he said belonged to a pickup truck. In the hopes that he could flag them down and get help, Joe exited his vehicle and screamed for help, but no one returned his desperate calls. Joe later said that on that mountain he saw a group of men, one woman and a baby. This group walked on however and ignored him. Hours later, still sat in the car, he saw what he described as flashlights, but when he once more went outside to retrieve help, no one responded to his calls. Realising that he may be running out of time, Joe decided that his only remaining option was to walk down the mountain road towards a lodge roughly 8 miles away. During this walk, he passed Jack's 1969 Mercury Montego, nobody was inside, and Joe thought that it must have belonged to the group who had previously ignored him. Obviously, at the time, Joe was preoccupied with not dying, but authorities would come to the realisation that on that dark remote mountain road, Joe was the last person to see the Uber 5 alive. How did these men come to be on this inhospitable mountain more than 50 miles from their homes, you ask? Nobody knows. None of the boys knew this road and they had no business being there. Roughly eight years prior, William had gone fishing with his father at a cabin not too far away, but he did not enjoy himself and stayed home the next time his father made the trip. Around three years ago, Theodore went on a deer hunting trip with his friends in the Feather River country, but it was much further to the west than the area that the car was found. None of the boys enjoyed the forest, nor camping with the exception of Gary, who occasionally stayed out all night with his friends. It's important to note that each of these men led mostly stay-at-home lives, and no one could figure out just who or what might have taken them up that remote, lonely road. The car had stopped at the snow line, and although the tyres had spun, the car was not stuck and five men could have easily pushed it free. The gas tank was still a quarter full, meaning that the men were not stranded. Four maps were found in the glove compartments, including one of California. The keys were missing, but police managed to hotwire the car and found that it started immediately without a problem. The seats were littered with food wrappers that the group had bought earlier and everything had been eaten except half a marathon bar. The next finding was somewhat strange. The police detailed that the underside of the car was undamaged, bear in mind that the car was heavy, especially with five men inside. The stretch of road was very windy and bumpy, and somehow, in total darkness, the driver managed to navigate it perfectly. That was the conclusion the investigators came to, or in other words, whoever was driving must have known the road well enough to anticipate every rut. Given that Jack did not know the area, does this mean that someone else was driving the car? The families disputed that, stating that Jack was the only person to drive the car and he would not allow anyone else to drive. Investigators and searchers were hindered early on as a massive storm came in the day the car was found and over 9 inches of snow were dropped on that mountain. It was a perilous search and the SAR teams came close to losing members themselves just two days prior. Law enforcement was left baffled and the search turned up absolutely nothing. That is, until four months later. 
On the 4th of June, 1978, a small group of motorcyclists wandered into a deserted forest service trailer camp and at the end of the road noticed that something was wrong. They described inhaling a rotten, nauseating smell. It was there they made the discovery. Theodore was found inside a 60-foot trailer frozen to death. He was stretched out on a bed with eight sheets pulled over his body and tucked around his head. His shoes were missing and his nickel ring, gold necklace and his wallet were found untouched on a table. A gold Walton watch was also found and was missing its crystal, though the family said that this did not belong to any of them. Theodore was 5 foot 11 and weighed 200 pounds at the time of his disappearance. When he was found however, he had lost 100 pounds. His feet were badly frostbitten and beard growth showed that he had lived for between 8 and 13 weeks inside that trailer, starving. The trailer was located around 19 and a half miles from the car and he was wearing his shirt and pants. Law enforcement had no idea how he managed to reach that trailer. Did he travel there on his own accord and if so, how? Did he lose his shoes before or after reaching the trailer? They were never found. The trailer itself was locked and it's thought that Theodore had broken through a window to get in. He did not build a fire despite matches lying around. There were also paperback books and wooden furniture that could have been used. Over a dozen sea ration cans had been opened from an outside storage shed and one had been opened with an army P-38 can opener which only Jack Madruga and Gary knew how to use. Strangely, a locker in the same shed contained enough food to last a group of five all year. Another oddity was the fact that there was a propane tank in a different shed outside which no one had touched. Yuba County Lieutenant Lance Ayers was quoted as saying, all they had to do was turn that gas on and they'd have had gas to the trailer and heat. Lance was left absolutely perplexed and his entire spring was consumed in the search for these men. Lance had actually gone to school with Theodore and his brothers and despite not knowing them very well, there was something about this case that kept him awake at night. Phone calls were pouring in from all over the country. The men had reportedly been seen in Ontario, Tampa, Sacramento and others but none of them were ever confirmed and were thought to be mistaken. Despite being a skeptical man, Lance in his desperation consulted psychics who were also of no help and gave inaccurate information such as one stating that the boys had met their end in Oroville, in a two-story red house with the number 4723 or 4753. Lance spent two days looking for this property, but it didn't exist. Lance spent many hours thinking about these men and knew their names along with many facts about them offhand. Theodore was a very friendly, beer-bellied man and would wave at strangers even if they didn't wave back. He got a good laugh from phoning William and reading silly segments from newspapers or funny names from the phone book. Jack Hewitt was Theodore's best friend, his head had a slight droop and was slow to respond. It's thought that Theodore really cared for Jack and looked after him in a protective sort of way. Jack Madruga graduated from high school and became an army veteran. William was best friends with Jack Madruga and would spend hours at the library. And Gary, who he also knew as being an army veteran. This case was driving Lance mad and he wanted nothing more than to find these lost men. He said that he would dream about them at night and in one dream he got to embrace the five men. Then the next discovery was made. On the 5th, the day after finding Theodore's body in the trailer, both Jack Madruga and William's body were found 5 miles away from the trailer and 11 and a half miles away from the car. Jack had been partially eaten by animals and dragged around 10 feet to a stream. He was face up and his right hand was curled around his watch. William, on the other hand, was in a wooded area scattered over 50 feet. There was nothing left of him but bones. Because of this, Lance tried to discourage the families from taking part in the search to avoid the distress of finding their loved ones in this state. Two days later, off the same road but much closer to the trailer, Jack Hewitt's father found his son's backbone. Again, Lance did try to persuade him out of the search fearing that this could happen, but Jack's father insisted that he had to continue with the search, he simply needed to find his son. His skull was found the following day, around 100 yards from the rest of the bones. 
The family's dentist identified the teeth as belonging to Jack. At this point, it's important to note that Jack Hewitt's remains were found northeast of the trailer, while William and Jack Madruga's were found northwest of the trailer, a quarter of a mile away. Searchers found three wool forest service blankets and a two cell flashlight by the side of the road. The flashlight was slightly rusted and had been turned off. No one could figure out how long it had been there. These findings also posed another frightening question. Why, between these five men, did they decide venturing out into the forest with nothing was a better option than turning the car around? And where exactly was Gary Matthias? Gary has never been found. His tennis shoes were inside the same trailer as Theodore, but that is all that has ever been found in relation to Gary. At this point in the search, it had been four months, which means there was very little chance of Gary being found alive given the weather he would have to have endured and the fact that he had been without his medication for too long. According to his local doctor, Gary was one of their major success stories in the way that he had been able to manage his mental health. The doctor said that Gary was very settled and enormously attached to his family and could not understand just what had happened to him on that mountain. During the search for Gary, his stepfather said that the entire time he was up there, he was looking for Gary's glasses because he didn't think a bear would eat those, but they were never found. He admitted that he became tired of the reporters asking questions and tired of not understanding what had happened. Gary's mother found it very difficult to accept that her son could not be found and regularly went back up onto that mountain to search, despite being told that there was no place left to look. The most common question posed to investigators was, why? Why did the men turn east onto the mountain in the first place? Why didn't they attempt to free the car instead of walking into the pitch black woods? Did they find the trailer by chance or where they led there? Why did they never attempt to start a fire? Did Gary try to seek help and if so, why didn't his body or remains ever show up? Investigators later found that a snowcat vehicle had cut a path in the snow on February the 23rd leading to that trailer. So if the boys noticed this, it may have given them some hope that they were in an area where Forest Service employees might come back to. Another theory was that Gary may have convinced the group to head towards Forbes Town, which is an area between Chico and the mountain road so that he could visit a friend there. Though that fails to explain all of the circumstances. Did Jack Madruga simply get lost while driving deeper into the darkness? Perhaps the men thought that the car was completely stuck and in a panic walked into the woods to find help, though saying that out loud, it seems unlikely. The special agent from the California Department of Justice, John Thompson, was quoted as saying that this incident was bizarre as hell without a single explanation. Jack Madruga's mother said that she believes that there was some force that made them go up there. She continued, they wouldn't have fled off into the woods like a bunch of quail. We know good and well that somebody made them do it. We can't visualize someone getting the upper hand on those five men, but we know it must have been. Theodore's sister speculated and said they must have seen something at that game, at that parking lot. They might have seen it and didn't even realize that they had seen it. Gary's stepfather added that he simply couldn't understand why Gary must have been as scared as he was. He continued, they didn't even build a fire. They had all of those paperbacks and didn't even build a lousy fire. I can't understand why they didn't do that unless they were afraid. The only problem was, no one knew what they were afraid of, including the investigators. There was no evidence to suggest foul play, and yet the whole incident felt unexplainable if there wasn't. There are plenty of things about this incident that simply do not make sense, especially where the actions of the boys are concerned. Firstly, and most obviously, why did they travel so far from their homes? They drove up a mountain to a very remote area. Secondly, they abandoned a perfectly working car and decided to walk off into the woods in the dead of night. It's also important to note that the men walked uphill and deeper into the mountains in 5 to 10 foot snow drifts. Why in the world wouldn't they have walked back downhill if they thought that the car was stuck and wanted to find help? Travelling further into the unknown does not make sense. 
I can only imagine that the boys found that trailer as a result of the snowcat vehicle that essentially cleared a path to it. Did they all make it to the trailer? Given that three of the men were found in wooded areas off the road, perhaps they passed away before making it to the trailer. Theodore obviously made it to the trailer, did Gary make it there also? As said, he was never found, but his shoes were found inside, indicating that he was probably there at some point. Theodore had managed to survive somewhere between 8 and 13 weeks before succumbing to the elements. Was he in that trailer the entire time? He never made a fire. Speaking of which, were they trying to hide from something? Perhaps they thought that creating a fire would lead whatever it was they were hiding from right to them. The men were considered to be high functioning in regards to their learning disabilities, but were all acknowledged as being able to function well. Given that they drove away from the direction of their homes and into the mountains makes me feel that these men were truly scared of something. Were they threatened or trying to flee from some sort of situation? Going back to Joe Shones, he was absolutely sure that he saw what he thought were two sets of headlights on that mountain. He said that one of them belonged to a truck. Could the people in that truck have been chasing the five men? Could that have been why the men drove into the mountains in an attempt to lose them? Though if this was the case, it means something must have taken place at the market they stopped for food, since they went there in the first place after the game. Joe also spoke of seeing a woman with a baby on that freezing mountain. Was he hallucinating? He also said that he thought he saw flashlights, but when trying to get help, they turned off and he was ignored. This was also coupled with whistling sounds, but when he called for help, they stopped too. When Joe walked down the mountain to get help, he passed Madruga's car, but didn't think much of it and didn't report it until he'd heard about the disappearances. After considering all of the facts of this case, I'm just left scratching my head. I can't come up with a simple explanation as to how these five young men, who despite their learning disabilities seem to function very well, managed to succumb the way they did. They abandoned their working vehicle in the middle of a blizzard and then wandered out aimlessly into the forest. Some, or all of the men found that trailer and then starved and froze to death for months despite having access to a fuel source and food. It seems to me that something highly unusual took place on that remote, lonely mountain road that night. I truly wonder if they saw something that absolutely terrified them to the point of no return. What exactly took place here, it's unlikely that we'll ever know. I want to end this by saying Gary was never found and there was no evidence of foul play. What do you make of this incident? Have I missed anything or do you have an explanation that I haven't thought of? Let me know in the comments. I came across the disappearance of Bobby Panknin, who was four years old at the time when he disappeared from Deep Lake in the northeast of Washington on the 3rd of August 1963. At the time, Bobby was on a family camping trip at this place and on that day, his mother had taken him and his two brothers, 6 and 10, on a short hike that didn't stray too far from the campsite. It's not completely clear what happened on this hike but Bobby somehow managed to get separated from his mother and brothers. Two days into the search effort, authorities had absolutely no idea what could have possibly happened in this incident. A Spokane boy was the object of a widespread search Monday in the rugged countryside near here. Searchers probed the waters of Deep Lake searching for the boy who was reported missing Saturday there is absolutely no clue to his disappearance, Stevens Country Sheriff A. E. Halter said. Bloodhounds have failed to turn up the tot's trail. At the time of his disappearance, there was nothing untoward that seemed to take place. The family never heard Bobby shout or anything like that, and there was no evidence to suggest that an animal was responsible, which we'll get more into in a moment. First, something odd. The fifth day of searching failed to turn up any trace of Bobby. The Spokane boy was barefoot and wearing a swimsuit at the time. Hopes were raised earlier Wednesday with the discovery of a youngster's footprint. A bloodhound from Seattle found the print. The 80 pound animal named Caesar was unable to uncover any trail. This footprint was assumed and treated to have been left behind by Bobby. 
It seems to have been a singular print with no others surrounding it which was odd, and by that same token, seemed to have been alone. It's important to note too, that where the print was found was off the beaten track, and searchers were armed with power tools to help them make their way through all the long tangles of this area. It seems that after the dog failed to pick up any further trace after this print was left, hope began to drain from the situation, and Sheriff Halter basically went on to say that he had no ideas left in how to deal with this. In the face of diminishing hope, the search goes on and will continue to at least Sunday. We're nearing the point of desperation. We don't know where to look next or what approach to use, the sheriff said in describing the search. The sheriff went on to say that the search area had already been widened and many more members brought in. But the area was so rugged that it was just unbelievable that little Bobby could have gotten too far away on foot, alone. Now, this is where people began to blame bears or another animal again, and it seems that the sheriff and search leaders already knew that this wasn't the case because it had been explored once, but to put it to bed. Some search detachments with bear hunting dogs went into the hills yesterday. Halter said the move should prove or disprove speculation that some sort of wild animal might have taken him. These efforts provided no evidence whatsoever that a bear was even in this area. It was also noted that if this had been the result of an animal, it would be highly likely that the family would have heard the event take place. Now, the sheriff said something interesting. Instead of disappearing on foot, the sheriff begins to contemplate a disappearance from above. I could go along with the possibility that he could have been taken by an eagle, but it's difficult to accept the boy's disappearance by either a bear or a cougar, said the sheriff. That's the first time I think I've ever seen the search leaders blame an eagle or being taken from above. But when you examine the details, you can begin to see why. Bobby disappeared right under everyone's noses. There was no sound or anything to suggest something was awry. For that reason, it becomes difficult to make the case that someone took him. Animal predation would have been obvious as very clear, unmistakable, and frankly, horrible evidence of that kind is left behind, which was never found. That leaves the sheriff at the eagle. But even with that, I'm almost certain you'd have heard that go down and a shout or something like that from Bobby, but none of that ever happened. These were the final words on the incident. A day-long search by more than 200 persons failed yesterday to find a trace of Bobby, and authorities reluctantly announced that the official search is over. No trace of Bobby was found in a week of searching. It's all over now, announced Sheriff Halter. Anyone who wants to can come up and look but the official search is over. This is one of those rare incidents in which not only was Bobby, or even a hint of him ever found, but the authorities and the searchers alike had absolutely no idea what took place that day. They seemed to rule out everything, which only served to make the incident all the more confusing. It seems that the lone footprint only served to make it worse in that regard because the dogs weren't able to follow it anywhere. Perhaps that was another reason that led the sheriff to the remarks about going up with an eagle. Whatever the case may be, I can't imagine that we'll ever know now. And that's also the end of the paper trail, so let's move on to the next disappearance. Hey, Adam here, and welcome back. I've come across what might be one of, if not the most unusual disappearance that I've ever covered on the channel. It's one of those disappearances where some of the elements of the incident just don't make sense together. Right, from the get-go, let's get bizarre. This disappearance is strange, and to be honest, I'm surprised that I was able to find so little coverage of this event. I've no idea how this incident didn't generate more coverage and discussion. Let me take you back to June of 2005, Northwest Territories of Canada. David Horsey and Frederick Hardesty were good friends, described as inseparable, and both loved the wilderness. In June of 2005, the pair had decided to stay at a cabin around 75 miles to the northwest of Fort Simpson. 
It was never stated what their plans were, but it seems the two just wanted to spend some time together, do some hiking, and things like that. The first press report, one of only a few, comes from the CBC.ca. Police in the Northwest Territories are continuing the search for two Fort Simpson men who disappeared last week. David Horsey and Frederick Hardesty were last seen at a cabin on the North Nahani River on June 12. When the cabin owner went to check on them four days later, they were gone. Anybody that we've talked to has said there's really no reason why they left the security of the cabin. There's no apparent signs of any problems that we can see. They left the cabin unarmed, and the arms that were stored at the cabin were still there. There was plenty of food and shelter, so nobody can seem to speculate as to why they left. You'll note that Constable Parker has said that there's no apparent signs of any problems that we can see. The fact he said that, to me, is absolutely bizarre because I'm going to present you with some pretty damning, conflicting information shortly. Given the details of this incident, which we'll get into, I have no idea why certain signs or evidence was ignored like this. In any case, the police stated that their disappearance was not being considered as suspicious and that their efforts were centered around the North Nahani River with thermal imaging equipment. I'll note here that the pair were reported missing by the cabin owner on the 16th of June. On the 28th of June, we get an update from cbc.ca. Searchers find body of missing man, foul play ruled out. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police say volunteer search crews have found the body of a missing Fort Simpson man near the North Nahani River in the Northwest Territories. The body they're referring to belongs to David Horsey, and they found him deep in the bush, almost two and a half miles away from the cabin. Here's some more interesting information. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police say that David's body was found intact and that foul play is not suspected. A member of the search team, Jonas Antoine, said that David had burns on his hands and arms. It will give us a cause of passing, and it will give us some closure to actually answer some of these questions that have been unanswered for the last 7 to 10 days, says Royal Canadian Mounted Police Corporal Al Shepard. Shepard says the area was searched several times before the body was found. The point was made that it wasn't clear if the body was there initially or if it was missed because of the thick brush. That piece of information, I suppose, will never be fully understood now. Only those involved could know the answer to that, but in fairness, they might not even be completely sure themselves. Now, is this a simple coincidence or something more? Search teams say the body they found in the North Nahani River on Thursday night was Fred Hardesty. Searchers found the body of David Horsey in the bush not far away last week. People from Fort Simpson and other Decho communities have spent close to a month combing the thick brush. The body discovered on Thursday night was found floating in the river about 12 miles from the cabin. It was an area searchers had already covered several times in canoes and on the shore. So here we have both men who were found separately, exactly 10 days apart, both in areas that were previously and unsuccessfully searched numerous times. Is that nothing more than a coincidence, or at some point do you have to entertain the idea that they may have been placed there after the fact? Now by who, when, and how is nothing short of bizarre given how many people were in the area looking. And it doesn't really matter who you are, carrying a fully grown man in rugged terrain is no easy or simple feat. Let me be clear, that is nothing more than speculation, but I would be surprised if the authorities went silently exploring the possibility of the involvement of a third party. Jonas Antoine was also part of the searching party that found Frederick, and he showed some confusion, which in fairness, I can understand. He said that while it's a relief that they've both been found, there are still many unanswered questions about what in the world had happened here. Now after that, from what I can tell, there was absolute radio silence in regards to this disappearance for 13 years up until May of 2018. This is where we learned some very interesting things, and I did promise you some contradictions to what was earlier said by Constable Brad Parker. First, let's get some more information on the table. Family members of the two men are calling for the Royal Canadian Mounted Police to reopen the case. The family said they are not happy with the way the investigation was conducted and they want closure. The men had been missing for almost a month before their bodies were found. It was determined that David passed away as a result of hypothermia and Frederick drowned, according to David's brother. 
David's sister then went on to say that she wasn't convinced that the investigation was very thorough at all. And I get the impression that they were left in the dark a bit. This whole situation makes me think that the authorities knew very well that this incident was highly unusual and perhaps that they didn't have all the answers. David's sister posed this question. How could two men in one weekend both pass away, one in the river and one in the bush? It's very unsettling. There's no closure. Now let's get really bizarre. There was something else that happened. Joseph Horsey, David's stepbrother, was part of the search party for the two men and he said they found strange things at the cabin. Arms had been fired all over the place, one of them leaving a hole in the floor. The picture is bigger than just two guys, one who passed away due to hypothermia and the other who drowned. There was something else that happened before all of that came down. Now, call me crazy, but it seems to me that after you found that kind of scene at the cabin, where there was clear evidence of something happening, then you find the bodies. How on earth do you not entertain the idea that the two incidents may have been associated in some way? What? One of three things has to be true here. Joseph and the family were mistaken about the findings inside the cabin, which doesn't seem to be the case. Or investigators were keen not to display the whole picture for whatever reason or the most incompetent people on the face of the earth were in charge of the investigation. One of these things has to be true. How do you not entertain a link between the two findings, unless it was done so silently behind the scenes? When Brad said, there's no apparent signs of any problems that we can see, am I just out of my mind or what? If what the family said is true, that feels like there's some major gaslighting. There's no apparent signs of any problems that we can see, except the clear signs of a disturbance inside the cabin. Right, now the question must be posed, according to what has been said, something big appeared to have gone down while the men were inside the cabin as they discharged their arms all over the place, according to Joseph. Why did they do this? According to the authorities, there was no evidence of foul play, and according to Joseph, the firing looks to have been done from inside the cabin. Who, or what, were they firing at exactly? Did they discover that someone else was inside the cabin with them? Did an animal get in? It seems to me that David and Frederick may have been scared of something or else they wouldn't have fired all over the place. What exactly happened inside that cabin? That really is strange and I don't have a great explanation, nor do I have an explanation as to why these details were promptly ignored. They weren't even reported until 13 years after the fact. Let's also be clear, neither of the men had been struck by anything. David had burns on his hands and arms, while injuries to Frederick were never mentioned, and the family never mentioned injuries either, so it can only be assumed that there weren't any to speak of or they'd have been mentioned. And in all fairness, these things are normally mentioned. In any case, how did David manage to get burns on his hands and arms? The official conclusion indicates that hypothermia was to blame for David's passing. So could David have been trying to get a fire going and then he burned himself? If that's true, that would imply that he had a fire going at some stage, so why did he choose to leave it behind? If he was cold and freezing, does that make sense? Secondly, why did the pair split up? This whole situation stinks of fear. From the findings inside the cabin, to leaving the cabin unprepared and then splitting up? Why did any of that happen? Could David have left the supposed fire to attempt to find Frederick? Of course, everything I'm saying now is pure speculation, but something here just doesn't make sense, and I can see why the family started to raise these questions. Right, here's some more information. Both David and Frederick were described as experienced Bushmen. Robert Hardesty, Frederick's brother, said his family wasn't satisfied with the police's handling of the case either. There's too much evidence. They didn't look at what we found. Adding, they found his brother's shirt with a big hole in it, like it had been blasted. To summarize, the owner of the cabin saw the pair on June the 12th and said that they were fine and enjoying themselves. He stops by on the 16th of June to find the pair missing. He notes that the cabin was locked and that their arms had been left behind. On the 18th, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police begin the search effort. On the 23rd, they're no longer heading the search, leaving residents and family to continue on. So according to CBC, they were heading the search for five days and then left it to other people. What? Good actual lord, there's so much to unpack here that it just feels impossible to get a grip of. Five days is a very short time period for the official search to be handed over. I've never come across that before. Normally it's weeks before the search is scaled down and then it's handed over. Right, so on the 27th, David's body is found in the bush in an area that was searched numerous times. 
Ten days later, Frederick's body was found in the river, again in an area searched numerous times already. The only injuries sustained were bends to David's hands and arms. What a coincidence, it's not impossible that it was just an unsuccessful search both times. But is there a possibility that they might have been placed there after the fact? That doesn't seem impossible either. The authorities didn't believe that foul play had been involved here because of the lack of injuries to point in that direction, which I suppose means that the bodies themselves didn't show signs of a struggle. The state of the cabin, according to the family members, seemed to show that if there wasn't a struggle, there was at least a panic or an incident of some description. So what are the possibilities? Was there a third party involved here? And if so, what was the motive and why is there a lack of evidence? If there wasn't another person inside the cabin, could an animal have gotten inside? However, according to the cabin's owner, the cabin was locked when he discovered it. If they were panicking, does that insinuate that they tried to lock something inside the cabin? Or does it indicate that there wasn't a panic at all and that they had time to lock the cabin? Or does it insinuate that a third party locked the cabin? I have absolutely no idea. Also, let's be honest, what were they even firing at in the first place? It makes no sense because it also means that after firing all over the place, they then left their arms behind and went outside. What? Actually, I suppose you have to discount the idea of an animal getting inside the cabin, because if the door was locked and nothing else was inside upon discovery, then that doesn't make sense. But then, what were they firing at? In some sense, that's the whole crux of the incident in question. If you simply ignore the findings inside the cabin, it becomes easy to say that this was an accident and the two men for whatever reason split up and then things went awry, which is how the authorities seem to want to present it. However, when you include the weirdness inside the cabin, that becomes less likely, especially when coupled with the fact that both men were found in areas that had already been searched. It's very difficult to come to any kind of good conclusions here because it's basically impossible to see the full picture. What do you think happened? Do you suspect some kind of third party involvement? Foul play? Or was this just some kind of accident? Do you suspect that the findings inside the cabin were associated with the disappearance? I certainly lean in that direction. Right, I suppose now is a good time to hand it over to you in the comments below, so get your thinking hat on. I'd just like to take the time to thank you for watching and to give a special thank you to the patrons who basically allow me to do this. If you found the video interesting, then please do hit the like button. And if not, then feel free to give it a thumbs down. I'm just looking for your honest opinion either way. I hope that you've had a great day or evening, depending on where you are. And I'll see you in the next one. Be safe, guys. Peace.